President, uh, years ago, talking like 15, maybe 18 years ago, I was speaking in a town in Oklahoma, and my daughter wanted to go with me, which was great. So we took off. I had reserved a hotel. And uh, so we get there. We're going to just stay overnight, and I'm speaking somewhere the next morning. We arrive at the hotel late that evening, and when I get there and check in, I, I knew initially we're in trouble. You have that feel when you pull up to the hotel and you think, this may not work. Pull up, check in, and, but there's no one at the desk. And then it just gets harder as we get to our room. It's dark, lots of light bulbs that are out in the passageway. Get to our room to be able to check in. And actually, when I shut the door and the two of us come in, I shut the door behind us and the crack underneath the door was so large, I could physically see the patio and the balcony, everything else outside. And it was so loud because it was right next to the highway. I thought, we're in trouble. This is just not going to work. So we ended up packing everything up and just going to search and find another place and thinking, well, there's no way we'll both be able to sleep. Now, why do I tell you that silly story? Well, when we were traveling and heading there, we, we anticipated one thing. And then we got there and went through the details and it ended up being different. I have to tell you, this past weekend, when I read through the 99 pages of the debt ceiling bill, I would read through a section of it and I would get to the end of that section and be surprised at the except for at the tail end of each section. It's not what I expected when I read through the document page after page. I have to tell you, we're a nation that leads the world. We're the world's largest economy. We're to be responsible in how we handle our budgeting in the process. We're to get it right because we're the United States of America. And I've been concerned for quite a while on the trajectory of our spending and have challenged us as a nation to be able to change the trajectory of our spending because we've got to start working back to balance. We can't get to balance in a year. It's going to take a long time to get there, but we've got to get started in this process. And my frustration has been is sometimes we seem to start and then we stop again, and then we start and then we stop again. For the several years that I've been here in the United States Congress, I voted for some debt ceiling increases because they changed the trajectory. And I voted against some because they were status quo or they didn't. I had higher expectations for this one. Now, initially when it came out, it was a, this is going to save $2 trillion. And then it slowly got downgraded to it's going to save a trillion and a half dollars. And then when we read the fine print and everyone's talking about how much it's going to save, I get to the fine print and find out actually it increases spending 3.3% next year. And the year after that, it increases spending 1% again. It actually doesn't decrease spending at all. It increases spending both this year and next year. But then it has the promise of the next eight years after that, that it will only grow 1% a year after that every single year, except that's not an agreement this Congress can make. This Congress can only vote on things for this particular session of Congress. We can't commit the next Congress to actions of this Congress. Each Congress stands on its own, and everyone knows that. It sounds good to say it's going to save these trillions of dollars in the next eight years, except each Congress will actually vote on a budget for the next eight years, and there's no commitment from future Congresses by this one to do that. In fact, I've been here long enough to be able to see agreements be made for what a future Congress will do that didn't actually happen. And so the $1.5 trillion in savings is only a decrease of the increase of how much we were quote unquote planning to spend but actually hadn't budgeted. Because as many people may know, there's not a budget set for the next year of what we were going to spend. So CBO just assumed we were going to increase at least by inflation, and any amount less than inflation is suddenly savings when there was no budget that was actually set. So my first big surprise was it actually doesn't reduce spending. It actually increases spending. The next big surprise comes when I start looking at how even some of the quote-unquote savings are actually managed. 
there's a supplemental piece that's in this, or a piece that's set aside where it takes the, what they call rescissions, and I get in a bunch of garbage gook that is tough for us to all be able to process. But there's about $22 billion that's taken out of items that were COVID spending that's not going to be spent and pulls it over into the Department of Commerce and leaves it there in the Department of Commerce amount and says, we'll decide later how to spend it. Now, I asked the obvious question, isn't this supposed to go to deficit reduction? And the answer came back, well, a few billion went to deficit reduction, but 22 billion actually went over into the Department of Commerce's budget and is being parked there, and they'll have other opportunities to be able to spend those dollars in the future. Well, that's not really a savings on the rescission. There's permitting reform in this, which I'm grateful for. Quite frankly, there's bipartisan support for permitting reform in many areas because we can't get lithium and cobalt. We can't move solar and wind power because of permitting, just like we can't move natural gas and hydrogen in CO2 because of permitting issues. We've got to do major reforms in those areas to be able to make sure that we can actually produce more energy for the future of our country. <clears throat> so when I saw the permitting issues, then I thought, good, we need to get started on some of these permitting issues, except when I read through it, there seems to be a lot of exceptions to it. For instance, there's a two-year commitment to say if you're doing the more strict environmental impact statement, you've got to get it done in two years. Well, unless the administration declares it complex and then they've got a lot more time. In fact, an infinite amount of time. It limits you to 150 pages for an environmental impact statement, which is good. That actually brings the paperwork down unless the administration declares it complex and then it's a whole lot more. It limits the number of pages even, unless it's the appendix. If the administration declares actually these are to go in the appendix, then there is actually no cap, no limit for that. It also says that in this time period piece, that if you get to two years from the environmental impact statement, if they don't achieve that, I ask the logical question, if an administration, an agency, doesn't get it done in two years, what happens? The answer is, well, you have to sue the federal government in that agency to make them do it. And then it has to go through the court system, which as this body knows will take two or three years. And then if the court finds in their favor, then the court can then declare that the agency has another 90 days to be able to get it resolved, unless it's considered complex. And then they have unlimited time. So the permitting piece, as I read through it, I thought, why are there all these exceptions that are out there that give it an out to every, every single portion of it? There's a section of the bill that talks about what's called administrative pay-go. That's a rule that's existed in some administrations before. Well, they will say, if you're going to add a cost to America through an administrative action, you've got to look somewhere else and decrease the cost. Because by the Constitution, only this Congress can actually increase spending. That's not something the administration has the constitutional authority to do. So that's a reasonable rule. So it puts in this administrative pay-go to say if spending's gonna increase based on a regulation, it has to decrease somewhere else. That sounds great until I get to the very end of it and it literally says, unless the director of the Office of Management and Budget considers the additional spending necessary. No restrictions. If it's considered necessary, then they have an unlimited amount that they can do. And even that restriction, actually goes away on January the 1st, 20 days before President Biden's term ends, so it's not even all the way through. The last three weeks, that, even that restriction goes away, and I can't figure out why suddenly it gives like three weeks of home base without a restriction like that, and why, if we're gonna put a restriction in there, why it would end in two years anyway? If it's a good idea, it should be a good idea for every president, not just for this one and why there would be suddenly an out clause in it. There's a 1% sequester that's across the board if appropriations are not done. Now, I have to tell you, I've worked with Senator Maggie Hassan on the other side of the aisle to resolve a way that we can end government shutdowns and actually do appropriations. We should do all 12 appropriation bills. The, the senator who's the chairwoman of appropriations here on the floor right now, she and I have had this conversation. She's committed to doing all 12 appropriation bills, so am I. We need to bring regular order and actually go through the process. We don't all agree on everything here in the body. Welcome to America. 320, America, 320 million Americans don't agree on everything. Okay, well, let's talk it all out. Let's have the debate, let's have the vote and go from there. We haven't had that ability in years now. 
So Senator Maggie Hassan and I have a bill dealing with ending government shutdowns and pushing us towards doing the 12 appropriation bills. That is not a bipartisan bill. Quite frankly, it's a nonpartisan bill. I don't find anyone here that doesn't want to actually give this back to regular order. So we're trying to find a logical way to be able to do it. But the way this bill sets up the sequestration to push us towards those 12 appropriation bills says that if appropriation bills are not done by April the 1st of next year, there's a 1% across the board cut that will happen in the current year's spending in the last five months of the year. That's a pretty big spending, except it really only hits defense because the way it's set up is non-defense will actually go up and defense will actually be cut by 1% from last year's amount. What in the world? Why would it be structured that way? Number one, why do we set up a sequestration piece at all as an incentive? Number two, why would it be designed to shape where it hits defense but not non-defense in the way that it's actually set up? And number three, when there were other options like Senator Hassan and I, our proposal to deal with ending government shutdowns and to get to actual appropriations, why wouldn't we do something like that that's nonpartisan, that's simple and straightforward to be able to do? The student loan suspension, there's been much publicity on the right about, well, this ends the student loan suspensions, except it ends it on July the 30th, when President Biden already says he's ending it on August the 30th. In fact, CBO looked at it and said, this doesn't save any money at all because it was already going away. It doesn't really change anything. It literally moves it forward a month, but doesn't change a thing. And then there's a work requirement process, which I have to say, I'm a big believer in work requirements. Not everybody here in this body is on that. I think work is dignity. I think work encourages families and it brings dignity to a family and an individual, unlike anything else that a family can bring. I think it's great for kids to grow up in a community where the adults around them work and they set that example and they build on that. There's just a unique dignity in work. Quite frankly, some of that just comes from what I've seen and some of that comes from my faith. Because when I look at even scripture, there was work in the garden before the fall. <laughs> work is not a consequence of the fall. Work is a gift from God that it gives us purpose and meaning and helps us set the next example. So anything we can do as a culture to encourage a culture of work, I think is beneficial to people and families. Now I understand full well that those that are disabled, those that have kids, there are situations where that can't be done, completely respect that. But in this particular bill, the incentives for work requirements has a little caveat stuck in the back of it that says all of this applies to these states and they can't take all these waivers where they pull away work requirements. They can't do those things unless Secretary Becerra, the Secretary of HHS, declares that that state's doing good work to try anyway. No restrictions on it. It just says solely, Secretary Becerra, if he decides that, it gets waived. So as I look at the bill, I see a lot of good intentions in the bill. But I see a whole lot of exceptions. And I see a whole lot of ability for the administration to waive that, waive that, waive that, waive that, that undercuts the purpose of the bill. Quite frankly, as a Congress, I wish that we could sit down across the aisle and we could have dialogue to say, what is Congress's responsibility? What are the policies that are wise policies? And not hand authority to the White House, Republican or Democrat, and to say, what's just good policy that we need to put in place and do those things? One day we'll get back to that, but that day wasn't today. And that's frustrating for me. So I'm gonna oppose this bill today, but I want us to be able to keep working because we still got work to do. Mr. President, is one side note as well. I know Congress is focused on this today, rightfully so. The American people expect us to get this resolved. But can I just tell you a little bit of a heartbeat issue for me? It's June the 1st. And that may not mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but for those of us from Oklahoma, today is the 102nd anniversary of the worst race massacre in American history. It happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, May the 31st, overnight to June the 1st. 102 years ago today, Greenwood was a smoking heap of rubble after an all-night violence and massacre on hundreds of black Americans in North Tulsa. It's a stain on our nation 
It's a stain on our state. And 102 years later, I hope we still pause and remember as a state and we continue to learn the lessons and continue to be able to work towards being a more perfect union. Today, the Greenwood Rising Museum is open. Folks are coming in and out, talking about what happened 102 years ago. Folks at the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation are engaging in conversation. There's community groups all over North Tulsa that are meeting with people just to be able to talk and to say, what have we learned 102 years later? How can we still be better as a nation still? We've learned a lot, we've grown a lot, but it's unfinished business for us. So on June the 1st, I remind us as a body, it was a massacre 102 years ago today. We shouldn't ignore this moment to remember how we take tragedy to triumph. I yield the floor.